I'm in a quandary tonight because uh, um, this is kind of like uh, the, the history that I wanted to talk about was about Hudson River, but it's kind of like talking about women in Hudson Valley history. Okay, I mentioned Carla, I was asked to do once last year, I've done it several times since, but it's, it's, an, it's an unending story and uh, I could go on and on and on uh, about it. And in fact, uh, here I am, you know, writing a purported history of the Hudson Valley, and they have to include the river in it. And when I stop and think about the importance of the river and the history, I think, well, gee, I could have written a history of the river. But wait a second, there's already about 20 or 25 of them. So doing it in the valley was a, was a way of kind of putting the river in context. But I think that it's true of the river just as it is of New York City that the river dominates the Hudson Valley by the sheer presence of the river and of itself. And even today, when I, I took a ride over from Red Hook uh, earlier, when you cross the river, you, you're kind of stunned by the breadth of it, by the size of it. Even though it's not the largest river in, in the country, it's really about 64th in terms of total water volume. And it's, it's that size because it, it looks that size. Uh, the, the sedimentation has raised the bottom up and raised the surface up and made it broader over centuries of time and continues, will continue to do so, I suppose. Erosion never ceases. Um, but, but also, the, uh, just the, the placid nature of the river in the estuary from Troy on down uh, gives it this um, quality that uh, is, 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 is a grandeur type quality. It's something that John Burroughs couldn't actually live with. He much preferred the intimacy of Black Creek. And he built his house uh, overlooking the river and kind of regretted that later, that he, he spent most of his time traipsing off in the woods and going over to slab sides where there was a little pond where he could sit and contemplate Mother Nature much better. Um, but I think that today, particularly because of what happened in the 20th century, we look upon the river as a dear old friend who was abused over time and who is now coming out of it, or has been for the last 40 or 50 years. And I want to kind of go back and talk to you a little bit about the whole history of the river and see if we can get to that point along the way. Um, after the Ice Age, uh, well, first of all, the river is about 190 million years old. I think that's the, the closest they, they come to it. And uh, the lower portion of the river was a bit different than the upper portion of the river. Uh, probably Manhattan didn't become an island until about 15,000 years ago, uh, when, the, um, when the Cooley effect basically dumped water of the river of Lake Albany, of Lake Vermont, of a third of Canada down through and burst a hole in the Verrazano area created the Narrows, that was a 20 mile wide terminal moraine. And this water came with such force that it, it just burst right through that and kept going for 100 miles across a plain and, and dumped into the abyssal plain, uh, you know, 120 miles out to sea. And with such force that the wake uh, spread for 100 miles in each way. And, the, and you can imagine how much force, how much water was involved in that. They carried everything along the way, rocks, trees, uh, mastodons, uh, all kinds of things along the way. It was a coolie effect. And in that process, Manhattan became an island. So it really is just one big cosmetic job, as we all thought Manhattan was anyway. But so was the rest of us, because everywhere where you look today is, is really the results of the ice melt and the deranged deglaciation that occurred, draining the water and leaving large swaths of, of land that wasn't there prior to the Ice Age 25,000 years ago. Um, Albany uh, sits on about 350 feet of glacial till. Prior to that, it probably looked a little like Hetch Hetchy Park, uh, with these very steep, uh, small, um, uh, very severe looking canyons uh, in that whole region. That was all filled in. Right? Do you know where the, you know the Saxon Flats, that area? 
Uh, well, it's, it's a beautiful drive when you're, when you're heading up to Hunter and you pass this, this beautiful northeast face of the Casco uh, along a flat, uh, really uh, very nice high water table in the land. Well, that wasn't like that before the ice age. When the, when the uh, ice came along, it, it basically lifted and pushed these huge giant boulders of rocks that were part of the landscape and left them in New Jersey. So that's what the ice did. And when it, when it melted and went away, we were left with this um, uh, proglacial lakes, they call it, one after another all over the valley. And they gradually, over time, water being what it is, finding its own limits, um, evolved into the various streams and hanging valleys and lakes and ponds that, that we see today. <clears throat> the first man uh, probably saw the Hudson River Valley from North Lake, where that is today, and probably saw the river. It was not the river that we see today. It was uh, more like a well, chasm. It was a, a lower, uh, uh, very violent, uh, very uh, um, and, and certainly uh, unnavigable, and uh, you should know people anyway. But it was like that for a couple thousand years. The fish didn't come back for about 4,000 years or so. They, they also left. And uh, the first man didn't have that. He might have been able to get to the edge of the river, but had no use for it. or wasn't able to use it or cross it or anything like that. So all the evidence of Paleo-Indian that we have are all on this side of the river. There are none on the east side of the Hudson River uh, until you get to the Lake Champlain area, which is above the Hudson. Uh, so the river itself kind of evolved over time, just as the rest of the landscape did. Um, the Native Americans in our prehistorical period um, had a use for the river after they, the, the fish came back and the anadromous fish came up the river and they developed the, the tools, the scrapers and, and other types of tools that they used in, in catching and uh, preparing the fish and also in, in going to the shoreline and taking advantage of, this, of the shells that, that Accumulate along there, there are shell heaps up and down the river, particularly the lower area, where you can see that uh, people actually stopped and just ate a lot of clams and a lot of uh, uh, um, crabs and, and other mollusks uh, while they were there. Um, and that was typical of the spring and summer season. And these were people who moved with the season to wherever the food resource was. And in the, in the spring and in the summer, they stay near the water, near, near the river. Um, there are very few, I'm trying to think now if I can recall any particular Native American myths or legends that are necessarily associated with the river, with the Hudson River in particular. I, I don't know. I don't seem to think of anything until, uh, um, well, even then. When, when, the, when the Dutch came in 16, after 1609, that's all they used was the river. They had no idea of the internal passageways that the Indians used. They would have been astonished if uh, somebody had told you that uh, the uh, people who lived uh, in Wappingers were related to the people who lived in Greenwich, Connecticut. That they were first cousins. And that they, that they, they frequently corresponded with each other when traveling to each other. Uh, they would have been astonished at the notion that on, on a single day, a single morning actually, you could walk from the Connecticut border to the Hudson River and back. Imagine trying to do that today in Westchester County. It might be a little tricky. Uh, uh, and everything that they may have learned about it, probably they took in as if it were involved in some type of maze-like obscurity. <clears throat> so the Dutch were strictly waterbound. Of course, that was the main contribution that they brought. Unlike the English, or um, Spanish in Florida, uh, they penetrated the Hudson River Valley because of the river 150 miles inland by our uh, And uh, <clears throat> that itself was an astonishing fact for the other European traders. Uh, the British uh, very, very much envied it, the English uh, in, in New England and uh, frequently made attempts to establish trading posts along the river. One of them during the 1640s or 1630s was at Anglin Island, about 10 miles upriver from here. It was 
it's very near to them, but they can come in over land from uh, New England to establish a trading post. And uh, Walter von Twiller, the governor at the time, chased them off and allowed them. And even when the English came in, the governors would not allow the New England English to come in and from the interior and settle along the river. Uh, and they insisted that all the trade come down from Albany to, to the river and be shipped from, from the river to Albany. And that was really the start of the so-called upstate downstate issues that, that we still have today. Uh, they all have to do with the economic geography and, and uh, created such problems for the Dutch aristocracy in the Albany area and all during the, the colonial period as well. Um, 1640, 1652, Adrian Vanderdonk published this great uh, description of New York, the first travelogue of, of, uh, of America, I suppose you could say. And he talked about the river, and uh, um, he, he mentioned one, one thing that struck me was he, he saw Capo's Falls, and uh, he, he described it as something that Greek and Roman poets might write about that was so astonishing. But this was pre-enlightenment thinking, pre-romantic thinking, and Adrian Vanderdonk never could have written about it in any lyrical or romantic fashion, as happened in, in later years. Uh, they didn't have that type of sensibility or that type of consciousness about the river. So the information that we have about it is really its usefulness, its utility as an economic geography. Uh, that, that persisted throughout the English period as well. Of course, the agricultural institutions that were created from Killian Van Rensselaer on were these huge manor systems and manor farms. Now, these people were not farmers. They, were, they considered themselves merchants of agriculture. And back in Holland, the most important people were the merchants. They weren't the aristocracy or the old knights from the medieval period. They were the merchants because by Killian Van Rensselaer, a diamond merchant, because they were the people who had already proved themselves. They had shown that they could succeed. And this was also the, the uh, post-Reformation period, the emergence of Protestantism as the hallmark of, of uh, the new economic times. The invention of money comes along during this time period. Just a little aside, I was struck by the fact that Sweden, I think, has just um, gone to the gold standard or, or passed some new money law. Sweden was the first country that introduced money, or the abstract notion of money. And their money was rocks. And the tax collector, that's why you started to get good roads in Europe, because the tax collector had to go around and collect rocks from all the property owners and bring them into town. And they stockpiled that at Port Sweden rocks, I suppose you call it. I don't know where it was, but that's the strangest thing to me. And I think after a while they kind of figured it out. And the Swedes were the first ones to come up with uh, email forms of barter, I think, as well. So they, they went uh, full circle on it. But anyway, that didn't happen here. Uh, and, but, the, but the river was the artery of commerce. And uh, the farms that were along either side, mainly on the east side, the huge manor farms composed of hundreds of farms, all under one single ownership. These, these people would bring their goods to, to the river every year uh, for Rensselaer so it could happen on January 1st. And uh, they would be required to you know, pay their uh, tithes or whatever uh, dues or rent that they had to, to the man of Lord. It might include a day's riding, helping to repair roads, or they would have to bring in three fat hens and give to the man of Lord. Um, you know, little things like that, but not so little when you think about it the labor to the it all. And all that occurred um, because of uh, getting the goods down the river to the markets in Europe via New York City. And here again, the, the city was the, was the locus where all the wealth came into and uh, where the, um, the leadership congregated. The manor farms were run by the wives of the manor lords. The manor lords went down and hung out with the governor at the governor's council, and because that's where they could best influence how they could make the most money out of their goods, and also to carry out the trade with their partners in Europe. Uh, so uh, it's astonishing when you stop to think about uh, some of the things that these 
men or ladies did. Alida Livingston, Robert Livingston's wife, after they um, got the job to victualize the Palatines in 1710, had to produce 800 loaves of bread and over 1,000 gallons of wheat beer every day for these people. Uh, her husband was sent up uh, barrels of salt and meat, usually <coughs> rancid, usually bad. Uh, he was a real scoundrel about it. But it was up to Alida to keep them happy, and uh, that was very hard to do. Um, and I lasted a couple of years, and then that whole scheme fell apart as well. But um, the men and ladies were the ones who pulled that act together. Maria Ransomier was further up river at Cralo. And he, these are the, you know, they aren't the aristocrats yet, um, but in the, in the 17th century, the, the husbands were known as gentlemen of note. They weren't considered lords yet. Uh, but uh, when you stop and think about it, these were the wealthy people at the time. And uh, Maria van Rensselaer uh, lived at Cralo, and a freshet came through in the river one year and wiped out her whole estate. And she spent uh, the next two weeks on an island fending off the snakes that went on the island too to escape the flood. Uh, and if they had anything in their house that represented wealth compared with other households, it might be some two or three pieces of fine furniture that, that were brought over from Holland, or some silverware from Boston, some frame, a framed photograph or a painting or two. Very little, though. It's a very austere lifestyle, even for the aristocrats. But the river was the artery that carried it all forward. Anyway, here's how I <coughs> opened this book. And I did it partly to try and not have to talk so much about the river, uh, but I I opened up by the chapter entitled The Valley That Is a Door. And that comes from an old uh, Native American term for Lake Champlain. Um, something Guarante. Anyway, the, the, the term means uh, the, the lake that is a door. Because for the Mohawk Indians, Lake Champlain was the door to the Peltray of the lower St. Lawrence River. So I use that image to suggest that the valley was the door to not just to the interior, but from the interior with the goods of the interior and, uh, to be delivered back in the homelands. How does the valley grow? Outward, along the spokes that bind the geography together, its sinews connected in myriad waves to the backbone that holds the frame, the artery of its strength and power flowing through. A valley grows around its river, around, along its breadth and width, ripe with expectation and promise, vigorous in its amenities and harsh when in decline. The Hudson River Valley had the most beneficial hallway into the continent's vast interior at its portal, and an unrivaled harbor and island setting through which the river also flowed. The navigable river, navigable river rose deeper in the continent than anywhere else in the east. In the 18th century, the manors of the valley became large-scale commercial operations where the lords were more than farmers. There were merchants of agriculture to the world markets, and the river was at their door. <coughs> As I just said, actually. Um, and I go into a little bit about you know, where the river comes from, where the valley begins, and that. But uh, um, when you, I was trying to find a way to talk about the valley without having to talk specifically about the river. And when you look at it as the spine of a, of a, of a, of a body politic, so to speak, of the valley itself as the cup that's held together by the sinews of the spine, um, tying it together, uh, then to me that had made some sense, at least in an economic way. And also that's certainly how the expansion into the valley occurred. Farmers would come in, pick up a piece of land, usually a large piece by our standards, several hundred acres perhaps, of large families. And uh, when the, the children grew up, they became involved in the farm themselves. The farm was broken up for the sons, uh, and new farms were created. And those expanded further into the interior, just as, as, a, as a normal organic process. And that's exactly what happened here as well. <coughs> During the American Revolution, we know that the Hudson River was uh, the most crucial um, geography in the whole of the 13 colonies. 
everybody was just waiting for the British to come up the river and take, take it over, and that would be the end of the war. Because everybody, whether you were in a tavern or in the governor's council or back in London, or wherever you were, and people talked about this regularly. Everybody believed that the, kid in the river was the key. Well, Washington called uh, West Point, or, or the Highlands, the key to America. If you got through there, if you unlocked that door, you could control the flow of commerce back and forth between the industrial north, New England, and the agricultural south. Uh, because, of course, the, the Patriots couldn't go through New York, the British occupied New York during the war. Uh, so during, during the American Revolution, the river was the most important strategic avenue. And I, I kind of was kind of struck myself by the by the idea that, gee, it should have been relatively simple for England, the greatest naval power, power in the world, to have done this. And so I, I did a piece on uh, the um, naval battle, or the, the, the two naval ships, uh, the, the Rose and the, what's the, name, the Vulture. I get up to it. Anyway, they, they did an excursion early on when Sir Henry Clinton came, came to Staten Island. And he sent these ships and about seven other transports with it upriver to try and connect with Tories and to find sources of food, um, bring back animals for, for the troops to eat, and, and uh, to, to basically gauge or judge the strength of the of the patriots in the upper river area. They didn't get above. They didn't even get into the highlands. They get up to the Burr Pines, uh, uh, the Low West Point area, and. Uh, uh, what, what struck me was that, gee, the river is vaster, bigger than, than you imagine, especially down there, of course, the Tappan Zee and Havre Shore Bay. And these ships were like dots on the water in that sense. And the Patriots, of course, were on either side, like huffing and puffing and, and shooting at them and trying to do whatever they could to stop them. And Washington sent out fire ships from the Sport and Doyle. And, uh, there was a great battle that took place, a very intriguing history. You know, I, 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 got, I struggled with writing it. In fact, I got a, a position to stay at a, a, uh, an artist residence at Black Globe that the Catskill Center had. It was only nine miles from my house, but it was perfect for me because I could just get away from the whole world and, and sit there and work on that. Thing. And I uh, was able to, to write that piece. It was, it was very confusing to me that the, this, how diffuse this whole geography was in terms of their inability to just grasp hold of it and take charge and control the river. And of course later on, a uh, year and a half later, when this scheme that John Burgoyne developed to bifurcate the river by coming down from the north, from the west, and from the south, it fell apart, partly because Henry Clinton didn't get the right message and he didn't go up north with the fleet. Instead, he went around to Philadelphia, which, and George Washington, wondering what was going on, he was sitting over in Smith, Smith Globe, over behind the Highlands. So he wound up going to Philadelphia, too, in that big battle of Germantown and all that. Um, but John Burgoyne was left holding the bag. Uh, saint Leger uh, was defeated at Herkimer, thanks in part to Benedict Arnold, and then Burgoyne was defeated at Saratoga twice because of Benedict Arnold. Um, that whole scheme to divide the colony by coming down and taking Albany just didn't work. Uh, and the geography worked against the, the English. And the, the Patriots, by this time, knew the geography as well as the Indians did. And uh, Peter Schuyler, uh, in particular, uh, I'm sorry, Philip Schuyler, in particular, was very important in that effort in uh, stalling John Burgoyne coming down from. from through Wood Creek from Lake Champlain to, to uh, the Hudson River. Um, well, the Hudson River is not as simple as it seems, even though it dominates the landscape. You can't say that whoever dominates the Hudson River dominates the, the, uh, the state or the area. And uh, uh, even though they all tried to do that, and everybody thought that's what would happen. Of course, Washington made sure that it was <coughs> principal a place of uh, for his command was on the Hudson River at Newburgh and elsewhere along the river, for Franks and uh, Garrison and, and uh, along there, because again, the same persistent theory continued that 
whoever controlled the river could control the war. And I think that was true. And look who won, the ones who controlled the river, ultimately, in the long run. It, was, it also held or protected what Washington called the breadbasket of the revolution. And that was the great agricultural resources in Orange, Ulster, all the counties, and, and across the river as well. <coughs> After the revolution, the river became important as, as we know it today, as in, in a major avenue of commerce. Uh, this, this miniaturist painter, Robert, Libby, Robert Fulton, comes along and figures out a way to make uh, steamboats work better and cuts a deal with Robert Livingston, who has his buddies in Albany, give him an exclusive right to the river, and before you know it, uh, there are steamboats going up and down the river, and they have an exclusive for... Mm, almost 20 years uh, after the, the first death of Claremont and continuing on to the uh, great John Marshall decision on, on interstate commerce. And then once that happened and the river opened to commerce, then steamboats, the steamboats proliferated. The sloop, which was the defining craft of the Hudson River in particular, a wonderful, wonderful craft, smaller than the Clearwater, um, could be operated by one or two men and uh, often what? And run back and forth across the river. In 1710, for example, when Palatine settled on either side of the river around Germantown and West Camp, and they were also in Rhinebeck and then in Newburgh. This whole area of the river was a beehive of little commerce that was going on back and forth. It was also connected with Lunenburg, Athens, where the Lutherans were, and uh, all along the river back and forth. People were moving to see relatives, to get married, to trade, to barter, to stay at her friends, whatever, you know, go to the, the concert, whatever they were doing back then. And we don't see that much today. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, with the steamboats, of course, uh, it wasn't the steamboats that caused it, but the Romantic era came into play. and. Uh, people began to look at the geography with, from a different perspective than that of the Enlightenment. It wasn't simply an economic geography, although the way they looked at it would turn it into that, but it was there just for the beauty. Um, um, after the Revolution and after the War of 1812, it was common for English travelers to, to come over to, to visit America and take a look. Their first stop would be uh, to Cause of the sun here at, uh, at John Andre's grave site in Tapai, and then proceed on up the river and just marvel at the beauties of this incredible estuary. Traveling through a fjord for one day, which I don't think they thought of at the time, um, but just so beautiful. And there again, this, this seeming contradiction exists. In how high are the highlands of the Lost of them are what, 400 feet, maybe 500 feet? Uh, I mean, the, the Catskills are, are uh, up to 3,000 feet, some of them, and they're considered puny. They're not even mountains, so, uh, and the highlands are even more so. And yet, the European travelers likened it to the Rhine. Indeed, for Carl Baedeker, the great uh, chronicler of travel in Europe, the Hudson was more beautiful than the Rhine. Uh, and uh, certainly it was in certain areas. Uh, and that became a theme throughout the 19th century in attracting people, tourism, to America. Tourist was a, a term coined by Byron, wasn't it, to, to uh, uh, describe these, these people who, who came and interfered with his Alps and, and uh, wanted to traipse all over his beautiful, precious, poetic land. But he was very much annoyed by it. And, and well, the tourists are still there, and so are the poets, I suppose. And they, they certainly are here. Um, and the other attraction for the river was that it got you away from the miasma and the dangers of the city, which was growing in such leaps and bounds that it became a safety issue. Of course, in the 1830s, a major fire wiped out the third of New York City, and uh, it was another reason for people to get out of town. Washington Irving, who was a boy, uh, 1800, well, before that, 1790s, there was a, uh, let's see, a, a typhoid uh, scare in New York City. So 
the wealthy people got their children out and sent them up river. And he came up to Tarrytown area where he stayed at the, at the home of uh, his childhood friend, James Kirk Pauly, his brother's home. Uh, his brother had married one of her his sisters. And uh, that, that, was, that was the source of their lifelong friendship. And of course, we know what Irving did, he created Sunnyside and uh, utilizing the whole romantic notion. I have this theory that, uh, I, it's derived from what other people have said, that the Romantic Era, they, perhaps the first act in the Romantic Era was the American Revolution, and that it was a completely irrational act. And I have the theory that uh, the moment in the American Revolution when that happened, when the Romantic Era began, was when John Andre changed his clothes. Because at that point, the British lost the American Revolution. Um, and his, his own commander, Henry Clinton, had told him, don't change your clothes, John. Don't, don't change your clothes. Uh, but he did, probably because he was convinced by Benedict Arnold that he had to in order to get back. And he was captured, of course, and treated as a spy and, and hung as a result, because he changed his clothes and carried the incriminating documents in his room. Uh, two completely irrational things that a respectable English manager never would have done. It he must have been Arnold who talked him into it. Right? So, so to me, that's the, that's the whole start of the Romantic era. Now, you know, some people say Turner, some people go back and talk about other things that happened in Europe and, and all that, but, and I'm sure I'm wrong. But uh, I, lo I love the notion and, and the whole idea of it. At any rate, uh, that also happened on the river, overlooking the river, at Shore Bay. Uh, Arnold and Andre met for the only time on the night before it all went loud for them. And they, they had to resolve certain things. How much was Arnold going to get paid? Or how was, what, what it was going to be? West Point or, or a fleet or whatever. And uh, that was all resolved that evening, except they overstayed their welcome. And Andre was unable to get back to his ship. So he fired upon him at first time point and had to float down the river to, to uh, the ferry town, Dobbs Ferry, in, in order to be protected too far for him to travel back by water. So he had to walk, took the ferry across the next night and had to walk down, and that's when he got caught. And by the way, John Andre, walking down the river with Joshua Head Smith, commented to him about the incredible beauty of the Hudson River. And to me, that's the first time I come across a, a comment that is strictly romantic in nature for, for, the, for this region. Alf Evers used to say that Pierre de la Vigar, who was one of the French fops who wound up in Tivoli under the um, protection of Robert Livingston, uh, wrote the first romantic description of the view from the Catskills when he went up on um, Catskill High Peak in uh, 1794 and had a picnic in honor of Citizen Genet back in, back in, uh, uh, in France. And, and that's probably the first written record of it. But, uh, anyway, that's enough about the, the romanticism, except that how do we identify the river today as this romantic wonder? You know, who cares? Actually, we do care that the river remains free of heavy industry uses, heavy commerce. There's a meeting going on in Poughkeepsie right now, a, an EPA hearing over the PCB issue. And they're being harangued by 100 people or more down there for not insisting that GE clean up the rest of the mess, which has migrated down from Fort Edward and is now in our midst here. Some of the scientists believe that uh, the PCBs have risen up with the water and dissipated into the air, and we're breathing them. <laughs> so, uh, and, and also the issue of the, uh, there's so many of these hot ticket issues, aren't they, about the river today. What the Riverkeeper has done in the last 50 years or 40 years, they, they've seen the whole rise of scenic Hudson from the Storm King event, and uh, clear water's importance, and, and uh, it's uh, it's symbol on the river, uh, the river that Pete Seeger wanted to see clean again. I'm going to have myself a bit, but um, this whole notion of the river co- existing in both a beautiful romantic setting and as an industrial uh, avenue uh, continued throughout the 19th century with very little comment or 
understanding to find people of the basic contradiction of thought. I mean, they, uh, I can't remember the quote you said, but the pollution, um, the solution is... Solution for pollution is solution. Is solution. The solution for pollution is solution. That was the poetic notion uh, in, in those days, and so it's today. Uh, the most significant uh, um, waste contributor to the river today is, is sewage from towns and villages that follow rainfall, especially in New York City. You get a, you get a quarter of an inch of rain and uh, the sewer is dumped into the city, into the river, instead of uh, being treated. And, uh, that's something that you know, departments and, and agencies and local government look the other way on uh, these days. I suppose that's okay, um, but uh, sooner or later we're going to have to come to terms with that as populations increase as well. Um, by the end of the 19th century, there is an understanding that the beauty of the river of itself, alone of itself, is worth saving. That was one of the premises that the Palisades Interstate Park Commission established when they began the fight against the quarries over the Palisades. And and the, and the quarries upriver who were taking out the rock in such profusion or to build New York City. And uh, that was a, a gentleman's uh, um, organization, um, almost a trout fisherman's organization, as Patrick Linehan might have said, uh, more of an elitist group uh, that were brought together by housewives from New Jersey uh, who approached uh, their governor and, and harangued him into doing something. And, Fortunately, our government at the time was Teddy Roosevelt, and he loved the idea. So they created a compact, the first ever, an interstate commission. And, uh, and with that, they were able to save the Palisades and, and that whole stretch of land quite up to the um, tour. And then later, with Harriman's help, again, more influence from big money and people who, whose interest in the river is essentially recreational and aesthetic. Um, contributing towards an expansion that is beneficial for everybody else, not by accident, but uh, not by prime design either. Um, the idea was to save the river so that uh, we have a better view across the river. We don't have to look at those um, uh, scalawags who are, take, who are taking out the stone and uh, pitching their tents there and living there year round. That was the whole notion behind it, the saving of the Palisades. It was a good notion, even though I put it that, phrase it that way. The underlying <coughs> idea was to save beauty, to, to keep this unbelievable geological uh, formation as something pristine for generations to, to enjoy. Um, the, the Palisades Park Commission, John Burroughs and, uh, and others who were of like mind in the late 19th and early 20th century, were conservationists at heart. They were not environmentalists. Uh, they, they looked at the idea of saving land as good for, for the community, for the, for the nation. But they didn't think of it as a, a militant situation. Um, now, the state of New York wasn't sitting on its haunches during all this period when, because their principal concern was with the economic geography and the uh, hauling of, of fish and Robert's Fish in the spring was huge during the late 19th century, early 20th century. And in the 1920s, that, uh, uh, let's see, they got the striper, the striped bass, the, uh, who the other fish? The shad. The shad. The shad. Yeah. So the shad disappeared from the river in the 1920s. And the state finally kind of picked up its head and said, wait a second, that's money. We're losing, we're losing out here. And they started to do some work. Uh, and uh, a couple of universities stepped up and did some studies in the late 20s and 30s. And uh, the, the effect of pollution began to be understood much better, uh, even though there was no real solution involved. Uh, but you know, what they, their solution was to declare large swaths of the river dead for fishing. Uh, the whole shellfish population disappeared between Manhattan and Tarrytown uh, by 1920, 1925. And uh, another 20 years later, and uh, the fishing uh, abilities up as far as the Kitsley were, were also wiped out. And, uh, and then, of course, by the 1970s, 
commercial fishing itself had to be completely abandoned because of the pollution. New York State uh, made efforts, tried to do things, and at the same time, what was happening was a rise, probably because of tourism, and this whole notion of heritage resources that took effect at about the time of the Palisade Park Commission, about 1890 to 1920, with this great insurgence of interest in heritage and historic resources in the state. Uh, that's when we got all our monuments and all our uh, books on, on um, agent state history. And, uh, the state library uh, took on a a whole new pattern of, of activity in terms of scientific journals and that. And uh, this is all because of an understanding that we, are, we have history now. We're not living in primitive uh, geography anymore. We have a geography that we created, and in it are, are certain wonderful things that we should preserve and, and we should keep. And by the 1950s and 60s, uh, this began to be understood as a uh, important resource. At the same time, that river uh, uh, interest, starting with the Hudson River Conservation Society in the 1930s, um, began to realize that just saving land just to protect the resources was a good thing because protection occurred because you weren't allowing more industry to come in. When uh, Moses Verplank uh, was an old man, he, he complained that, uh, yeah, the Hudson was just like the Rhine anymore, full of smokestacks. <laughs> the, the castles that, that, that were obscured by the smoke, and uh, the, the river traffic was, was like that as well. Incredible the amount of industry going on back and forth and up and down the river. And uh, when you think about the, you know, just wood alone, it's just the, the impact of the woodland movement. On, on the whole setting and, and smoke and all that that does. It's just unbelievable. I think uh, Hudson River steamboats consume something like 200,000 cords of wood a year. These are all provided by local farmers. They also sell wood to other people and, and use it for their, for their own self. And so our, our whole landscape was denuded in the process, which was good for farming. Uh, and, uh, you know, but at the same token, Nobody was like, you know, stopping and saying, wait, hold on a second, what exactly are we doing? Uh, and that developed slowly, and partly as a result of conservation interests. And then in January of 1963, this application comes along from Consolidated Edison, who put a pump storage facility at Storm King. And uh, some people, a handful of people, who lived in the vicinity or who appreciated the highlands, probably because of some fine writing that had been done and some fine thinking by the Conservation Society and some action by the state, and appreciation had grown for this particular setting in which we live that is dominated by this river. So they banded together and started <coughs> the Senior Hudson Preservation Society. Bob Boyle got involved. That's his soul. He died last week, age of 90. He was an interesting guy. He had an aquarium in his house that had a striped bass in it and an eel, and uh, he tried to recreate the bottom of the river in his, in his own living room. I met him once. I, I, uh, in my first book, I took issue with his claim that there wasn't a fjord in the Hudson River, and uh, I, I think I demonstrated that there was. Uh, and I pointed out that Bob didn't see this really obscure geological text that I had come across. So, and so I understood his opinion. I also understood in a way that, yeah, it's not a fjord in the Norwegian sense. You know, you don't, you're not driving down through this, this snow-clad, uh, narrow gorge uh, carved out of, the, out of the hills by the ice. But it is, it is a fjord, and it has all of the characteristics of it. The problem is it's 30 miles up river. It's not, it's not right to start with it. So Boyle, we met him in Bear Mountain one night, and he, I don't think he, he knew that I knew who he was, and he said to me, uh, you know, I'd like to talk to you sometime. You can tell me a little bit about geology around here. <laughs> and I kind of smiled because I knew what he was doing. And uh, we had a little joke about it. I said, you know, I, I said you're probably right in the long run. <laughs> and uh, we talked later when he moved out to Ithaca a couple of times on the phone. He was, he was quite a colorful fellow. And, and Carl Farmer, of course, who wrote the Hudson, which is 
the other great book about the Hudson River. I think it's second to Benz and Lossies, but they're, they're both really great books. Um, and, uh, um, well, I forget the names, but the people who wound up start, starting the National Resources Defense Council, Scenic Hudson, uh, all got together and started this whole movement against Con Ed. And that took 17 years to resolve. And that was the first real political environmental movement in the United States. John Muir was a political person, but he didn't uh, pursue it like that. They were going after the government and taking them on frontal, uh, full bore. And that's what C.D. Hudson did. That's what these people did. And they did it by appealing to the people. It was just this wonderful, wonderful story. Jim Cagney got involved. You've got to fight out our hands, he said. In typical Jimmy Cagney style. Uh, and uh, they wound up not only winning, but humbly on edge to the point where they gave the whole site to the state of New York to become part of the uh, whole House Age Park Commission lands. And they contributed uh, $10 million to the conservation fund that became the Hudson River Foundation, which is one of the most vibrant uh, foundations in New York history today. And uh, they also went in and rebuilt the, the waterfront for Cornwall and, and did a whole number of other things. They became friends of the environment as a result of the war. Also, Train helped to unseat Richard Nixon, who was one of the key players in, in that Hudson River compact that they called Franny Reese. So, um, and Franny and, and Bob are in a picture that I have of that moment in the book. But that was the start of the whole political conservation movement in America. Out of that came the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, Seeker, and a, a state legislature that for 15 years acted as uh, stewards of the environment, from Herbert Posner on through Maurice Hinchin in terms of the chair of the Environmental Conservation Committee. I worked for Hinchin during those years, it was very heavy times. And uh, none, all of these laws were passed. I think it was one of the most productive periods for the state legislature in New York history. And it wasn't like today, today's legislature over the last 10 years or so. Um, and at the same time, we were experiencing a rise in historic preservation, heritage understanding, heritage resources. One of the laws that they passed was the um, Hudson River Greenway. Uh, which became a connecting link for dozens of communities up and down the river to push forward with this theme of heritage tourism and heritage appreciation. Um, another thing, uh, let's, see, let's see, the other thing that they did was uh, the Hudson River Estuary Program, which ran down my blocks. One of the best programs for a river in American history, and it's still going strong today, thanks to Dunlop, who was adamant in not just ensuring that they got enough funding, but in expanding it beyond the river into the pieces of the spine that connect the river into the valley. So the tributaries are now also considered a part of the Hutch River estuary system, and, uh, and you can get some support for them. Um, I, I hope to get to the grants along the way. Um, the appreciation of that. And Grand Dumbo, of course, is a great historian as well. Um, these uh, oh, yeah, and the other thing Hinchy does is go, goes on to Congress, and he and Bill Clinton uh, cut this uh, uh, idea of creating the National Heritage Area. It started with the Hudson River Valley. And uh, Hinchy, uh, at Clinton's request, developed legislation for, I think, 22 more National Heritage Areas in the country. And uh, that alone has uh, infused this whole heritage theme uh, throughout the valley, you know, from Saratoga and Sweeney, the congressman at the time couldn't do anything about that, and from Saratoga on down to, to the Yonkers. And um, those three elements, heritage, history, environment, came together in an unusual uh, confluence in that period over the last 40 years. I call it a new consciousness in this book, uh, to the point where we, we now look at the river with such a passion. It's not John Burroughs' uh, distant friend anymore. It's our close acquaintance, our, our good buddy, who we're down at Poughkeepsie 
um, haranguing this, the federal government about tonight. John Bowermaster was in Red Hook last night showing his, his films, which are wonderful polemics on, on keeping the river clean, protecting the river. What Riverkeeper has done, John Cronin, Bobby Kennedy, uh, a whole bunch of them have, uh, it's just been unbelievable how they have helped clean up the, the water by using the court system. See, the Hudson, of course, is, is used in the courts, but also by purchasing land, by saving land, and by emphasizing this, uh, just the simple idea of it's beautiful, let's keep it that way. And of course, Pete Seeger, this, this wonderful uh, spokesperson <coughs> or icon for environmental issues when it comes along, you know, after having been booted around by the House on American Activities Committee, and, and writes a song about seeing his Hudson River clean again. And that takes off. He comes up with the idea for a ship, a sloop. I think uh, last week they were going to go to Washington to distribute uh, leaflets the way Seeger had done back in the 70s. But I think they got down to the Verano Narrows and looked out at the Atlantic Ocean and said, oh, we're going to go out there. That's too, too rough this year. And they turned around and took the train and drove back or something. But they are in Washington. And uh, you know, so uh, this is a confluence of new ideas, new thinking that are all associated with the river. And if you go and follow these this little avenues of the spine from the river, into the valley, you find the connections all along the way. I mean, you can't drive through this valley without seeing a historic marker somewhere. You can't drive through any town in this valley without <coughs> stopping or in your head at least for a moment and saying, gee, look at that. Isn't that something? Isn't that beautiful? Even the ruins have become a beautiful, wonderful, romantic images of our world, of what we have here. And uh, that, that consciousness has taken over even to the point of, of the minutia of uh, biological protection. Um, there's another conference going on today or tomorrow about invasive species and what we should do about that. Somebody was just talking about the sofas getting out there with their little chopper and chopping up all those water chestnuts. And, uh, that's a great little machine they've got. And, uh, it does a great job. Well, that's our consciousness at work based upon the history of the last century. That, that's our evolutionary movement into a better understanding of what quality of life means for us today. It isn't an elitist thing. It isn't a trout fisherman's thing. It's, a, it's an ordinary thing for people who live and use the Hudson Valley and for people who come and visit there as well. And I think that that's probably the saving grace for the valley. Uh, I hate to, you know, raise the specter of a national government uh, these day and age, but uh, we're worried about the Pilgrim Pipeline and the potential for the federal government to swoop down like some deus ex machina and say, oh yeah, we're going to put this here and put it there. Well, that isn't going to happen in this valley. Maybe it happened in North Dakota after a big fight, and that's still, they're still fighting that one. But um, I met the guy who was running the Pilgrim Pipeline at the end of the meeting, I said, what do you think about all this? You've got 22 towns in all New Jersey against you. And he said, oh, that's NIMBY. I said, NIMBY? I said, you're in the Hudson Valley. I said, this is where NIMBY was born. I said, you haven't got a chance in, in this valley. Said, oh, what are you talking about? Well, they haven't piped up since then. And I, I don't know if they ever will. Because um, state government, you know, Cuomo has his ups and downs, but he did it for fracking, and he let it happen with the pipeline. Too. He's going to just follow the will of the people, and the people are going to be against that, and that's what's going to happen. I don't think it would be a big fight, but that's why, that's what happens when a people develop a consciousness like we have. We look at everything all together and say, this is one piece that, taken together, is worth saving, is worth protecting, is the value that, that we put on our geography. And it's evolved over time because of history. I can't say it's all in here, but uh, you know, we just got around in here and you can find it. The last chapter I, I entitled A New Consciousness because, and you know, I was in the middle of writing that when I realized that that was what was happening with this history. And I, I began to focus more on that to understand it. When I was college at the Hutchinson River Valley Institute, 
which was an institution created in the National Heritage Area to teach teachers and to expand upon literature and, uh, and other ways in which appreciation of heritage and history is, is expanded through intellectual means around the valley. I helped them out once in a while, in the book review or something like that, and of course I taught there. But um, they are very much dedicated to this. And they, they just they said to me, you know, it's Hinchy. Hinchy's the one who did this. I said, well, he sponsored the bill. The law. He said, well, yeah, and, but it's his image that, that uh, people want to do this for. And of course, the news yesterday was that Maurice has a terminal um, neurological disorder. And, uh, it's too bad. I know that uh, he just wants to be a congressman. And, uh, and he can't do that anymore. Um, our heroes may go. Our, our new heroes may arrive. They're called uh, Kate Hudson, uh, the environmental lawyer from uh, Riverkeeper. They're called Bobby Kennedy and John Cronin. Uh, they, they are, they are called uh, Mary McNamara, or the, who are the, the four women who were honored by the Woodstock Land Conservancy for beating the, the uh, water project for Niagara Water. Uh, and they're called the uh, angels of, of the river. And uh, you know that's that's what's happening. It's, it's it's ordinary people who are stepping up and who are moving into the to an appreciation of their participation in this consciousness. I hope it doesn't end because of national policies or or the change in the environment, economic environment. But I don't think it will. I think New York will, will continue like that, and Hudson River Valley will be protected mainly because of the river. Uh, the guy who wrote the history of the valley, and for me to say that, it's, you know, an admission, actually, because I, all the while I'm thinking, how can I keep the river separate from this? How can I, you know, show the valley within the context of the river? And in fact, you can't. I mean, it's, it's just like trying to separate New York City out from, uh, or to bring New York City back as the Dutch, little Dutch uh, colony that it once was 400 years ago. And let will do that again. And the city has gone on and has basically overpowered the region by the sheer size of its presence. And that's the truth about the river as well. You know, when uh, people who, uh, I don't mean to disparage them, but I, I talk with people who are doing book reviews about my book, and they invariably start with the Erie Canal. And, you know, the Erie Canal was, wasn't here, you know. But that's how they think the commerce of the interior open. Well, it didn't. Uh, in order to get to the Erie Canal, you had to go up the Hudson River. And 120 years before the, the Erie Canal, that's what was happening. And what about the d &H Canal? That came first. And a lot more money came, came down through there for those first 20 years from the Erie Canal. But that's another argument. <laughs> I, uh, I know that by the sheer presence of the Maritime Museum here, uh, this whole concept not just continues but thrives. This is so marvelous how this has expanded over the years. I remember years ago when uh, the governor came down to christen a ship called Matilda after his wife. I guess it's still here. And you know, that was like, oh, oh. And I kind of walked away thinking, well, that's it, you know, for the governor and Miranda for a few years. And of course, Mario Paul was not a Hudson Valley uh, governor, he was a New York City governor, and his son is too, even though his son lives in Westchester. Uh, but uh, Mario knew the value of a good piece of PR, especially when you could involve his, his wife in it, and Matilda was, of course, the perfect representative for it. But that was a, this was a small place then. Uh, this was, you know, they, they kind of fit the boat in, uh, but uh, there wasn't much else going on there. I mean, I'm overstating it, of course. But then you look at it now. I was, I was talking to John Fowler so last night. He went on and on about uh, how great the Maritime Museum is, all the resources you have here, and what's, what's being done. And then you look out here, and you guys built this, built this boat in two and a half hours. <laughs> and, <you> know, okay, <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, that's what the power of heritage, the power of beauty, and the power of history can bring us to. We're in that we're in that concept now. We're, we're sitting here and we're listening to the school go on about it. But, uh, uh, I 
think that's that's one of the things that you could say the river has given us. And the, uh, it's a resource that just keeps giving us resources. And, uh, you know, the fish will come back. And they do come back every year. Um, I hope the commercial fishing doesn't come back. Uh, what was the numbers I saw? In 1887, there was something like 371,000 uh, pounds of, uh, or tons of, of uh, striped fish taken out of the Hudson River. Uh, 80 years later, it's 1967, that was reduced to 67,000 pounds. And, uh, and that was at the point when the state was starting to reverse the pattern. We have to give Nelson Rockefeller credit along the way for this, you know, the first environmental bond act, $1.8 billion, the cleanup of the sewer plants, another $1.5 billion that he threw at it. Uh, his uh, his uh, uh, conservation commissioner called him the improbable tree hunter. And that's just what Rockefeller was. And uh, he has his own uh, petty reasons for doing things, but you also could see the value, the economic value restoring the Hudson River and making the Hudson River pristine again. It's still a battle, it's still a fight, and we're still involved in it. And some of the players are in Washington as well, and we're fighting against. But, uh, you know, some of them are here too. We just have to keep that up. And, uh, we never do that, the Wonders Valley will thrive, and my books will sell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.